I do not believe in U.S. ethnocentricity. I think that we need to find best practices. And the models that I've developed and tested, even though they are principally based on U.S. practices, I have been able to adapt them based on culture, based on language, based on geographic region, based on territory that is around the world. And it's essential that this occurs for these models to work because critical incident management, as you're well aware, is not one-sided. Welcome back to the Crisis Conflict Emergency Management Podcast. My name is Kyle and I'll be your host. And in today's episode, we're going to delve into the critical role of crisis leadership and decision-making in high-threat situations. Our guest today is Mr. Stuart Myers, who is drawing from his extensive experience in SWAT operations and incident command, and will share his insights on effective leadership strategies, decision-making models, and the psychological aspects of crisis response. Now, in order to do, Mr. Byer, some good insights and, and sort of a good introduction, I have to turn it over to him to be able to give an introduction and, and sort of explain his career path and field and how he got into a position of where he is today. So, Stuart, thanks for joining us today and welcome to the show. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, just very briefly, uh, to tell people I've lived multiple lives. Like graduating with my undergraduate degree, uh, I started on the police department, Montgomery County Police Department in Maryland, got on our, what's called our decentralized SWAT team, and then our full-time elite centralized SWAT team. We were a very operational team at the time, running an average of three to five high-risk operations a week. Uh, they range from serving high-risk large service to going on murder suspects holding hostages. So we had a very wide range of operations. On leaving the department, I started a company training law enforcement and military personnel, primarily special operations, literally around the world. I've worked with agencies you know, on every continent except Antarctica. It's been a learning experience for me because I tell people I'm never done learning. I'm a lifelong learner. I was asked and accepted a position to be director of SWAT operations and training and create an elite SWAT team in Abu Dhabi of the United Arab Emirates. And upon completion of that tour, I came back and got my master's degree at Harvard University in which I focused on critical incident management was very fortunate that the degree was in international relations, but my professors allowed me to take essentially a non-existent track in critical incident management and apply that in an international context. Upon doing that, that gave me additional information. I run courses in the private sector for both law enforcement and military personnel. And then I got hired as director of public protection and safety at Louisiana State University in Eunice and was an assistant professor there where I developed their emergency management program as well as criminal justice and law enforcement courses. Still not being done with being a lifelong learner, I went back to school. I got accepted into the Columbia University Teachers College doctoral program where, again, I was very fortunate that I was allowed to focus my dissertation and my research in the doctoral program on high threat decisions. And that's kind of where we are today. A couple of books have come out. One is high threat, the latest one is high threat decisions when it's a matter of life and death. And then a preceding one was a SWAT operations and critical incidents, why people die, which I've been able to marry my operational experience, marry the contacts that I have made through decades of experience along with my academic. That's, that's kind of the short version. Well, that's quite a lot of experience. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And it's really interesting to see how your career has evolved. And I want to pick up on that point specifically where you were on this unique degree track that's blending both international relations and critical incident management. And so what I wanted to pick up on that was what drove you into looking at that and from that specific perspective? Because it's very rare to see people take these operational aspects and then put in an international lens upon them. And that's something that I find to be very rare. That's something that we do a lot at Capacity Build International and sort of our boutique consultancy piece is we do a lot of international work, but we're looking at emergency management as a mechanism to create stability, but that is very rare to find. And so what sort of brought you to that conclusion that that's what you wanted to focus on in that specific point in time and, and degree program? I had the good fortune to work with over a thousand different law enforcement agencies, not personnel, but agencies around the world. My initial background was principally in the United States, on the East Coast. 
But I learned very quickly that just because we do something in the U.S. doesn't mean it's applicable or even the best practices in other global contexts. So having the chance to work with these law enforcement agencies while they bring me in to learn from my background, I'm learning about their unique set of circumstances that occur in Asia, could occur in Europe, could occur in South America or the Middle East or the Caribbean, and how what we do in the U.S. can be adapted to their missions and how their responses can also be potentially adapted to what we do in the U.S. I do not believe in U.S. ethnocentricity. I think that we need to find best practices and the models that I've developed and tested, even though they are principally based on U.S. practices, I have been able to adapt them based on culture, based on language, based on geographic region, based on territory that is around the world. And it's essential that this occurs for these models to work. Because critical incident management, as you're well aware, is not one-sided. So I'm glad that you mentioned that because I'm now really curious about the experience of you then working overseas and, and working with all these different departments and agencies and then seeing how they, they operate and how they, they function. What were some of your key takeaways then when you reflect upon that? Like, where was it that we have been sort of indoctrinated, I guess I would say, for lack of a better term, in the U.S. methodology? And then... What was a point in time where you reflected and said, this is uh, maybe better than, or this is completely different than what we're doing in the U.S.? And, and it sort of was a light bulb moment for you. Well, I think one of the advantages, if you can call it an advantage, of working in the U.S. is, and especially in my background, I was very operational, which means it was high crime. People taking hostages, high-risk warrant service, armed barricaded individuals. We go on a lot of incidents. And again, I don't have the statistics, I don't, but anecdotally, we could probably own more high threat operations than anybody else around the world. Like I said, very operational team. So going overseas and seeing how that plays out for teams that don't necessarily have the operations experience, but they have other advantages. For example, you know, I don't want to cast aspersions on union because I come from the union background. Police unions manipulate and play a role in the way teams are managed and response. Overseas, there's not that limitation or benefit, depending upon how you want to look at it when it comes to pay skin. One of the, I guess you could say, an epiphany was teams that think they are operational overseas really haven't been on that many operations by comparison. They might train a lot, but they don't have the operations experience. And one of the things that was born out of my last study is the importance of experience. But experience can be good and experience can be bad. If we learn from our experience and it is adaptive experience, that's a very good thing. That helps form the basis for our decision. But there's also something called maladaptive experience. And that's where we might have done something and we got really lucky. But because we did it and it had a positive outcome, we essentially have validated our actions. And because we validate our actions, we're going to repeat it again the next. So there needs to be a clear distinction between valid experiences and adaptive experiences and maladaptive experiences and knowing the difference between the two. And that was one of the things that I tried to bring to my time internationally to explain to them, there's a reason why I think we should do these things. But we also need to adjust. And for example, I lived and worked in a Muslim country for two years. I had to adjust when we were going to train, when we work on a train, when I could push back prayer time, and when I said, no, we're going to follow the culture, we're going to follow the traditions, and we're going to take a break. So in those environments, when you're, you're seeing that we have to be adaptable and amenable and, and work in these different cultural environments... What did you notice in terms of the decision-making frameworks that people were using and, and how they were applying them within the context of their own operations? But I'm also curious in terms of your view of, let's say, setting up programs and setting up just the entire sort of public safety infrastructure and their approach to this based on their own communities and, and cultural aspects. Can you tell us a little bit more about your research and then also sort of these decision-making frameworks that what people were using and then how that sort of reflects upon what we do in the United States? But I need to kind of break down because you asked me like 10 different <laughs> questions. In this, this segment, so let me break it down a little. Overseas in the U.S., 
quite often the way we make decisions is based on what we did before, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. But quite often is, hey, this is what we had before. This is the way we did it. So we're going to keep on doing it. Sometimes that's right because you don't need to reinvent the wheel. But sometimes that's wrong, especially when we come up, again, speaking in a law enforcement or military context, with people who are serious, that want to challenge us, that are committed, that want to kill. That's a very different environment than going up against somebody who is not as motivated and doesn't want to kill. And just because we've done something and been successful in the past doesn't mean we're going to be successful in the future. So we need to have an eye on the present, but we need to look at what's coming in the future and what could happen. And part of adapting the takeaways from the research to adapt to these future questions is, is asking some kind of basic questions. What is the suspect's most likely course of action? That can apply in any environment. What is his or her most dangerous course of action? Uh, what do I need to know and how are we going to respond to it? That's kind of a basic model that came out. And to take that even more so into a general decision making in, in anything, whether it's disaster management or, or whether it is in other words, for a natural disaster, a terrorist incident, any type of crisis management, what's the worst that can happen? And our decisions need to take those two questions and answers to those two questions into account. And then when we ask the question, what do I need to know? We need to be prepared to ask these questions. Now, taking this into the, the second part to what you asked, in an international environment, it really requires all the time, but in a, in a significant number of times, a cultural change. When I went to the Middle East, my very presence meant that senior ranking government officials weren't doing their job. If they were, they wouldn't have needed to bring me. Some were doing their job, which is why they wanted to improve and why they brought me and other people in. But what happens in countries, especially countries that have money, that are willing to commit the funds to improve it, they might get a perspective from France. They might get a perspective from Germany. They might get a perspective from England. They might get a U.S. perspective, a Canadian perspective. And some of these perspectives can be diametrically opposed when it comes to managing these incidents. So at some point, somebody's got to say, hey, we're going to learn from all of this. We're going to study all of this. But this is the direction we're going to go. And because of the position I was given when I was there, I was allowed to make that decision. And I had to essentially create a cultural change over there. A lot is, is being talked about in business and government about affecting organizational cultural change. That applies across the board, and it is especially critical in critical incident management to make sure that we are going to do what is not just going to result in a successful outcome, but what is going to consistently result in a successful outcome, or at the very least, consistently increase the likelihood of a successful outcome. So based on that, and based on sort of that cultural context, background, and then, you know, I think the willingness of many international partners to take this sort of global view of how, in your case, say policing works and what's the best. How does that all factor in? And again, this is a large question. I'm sort of unpacking this as I talk to you, but how does that all sort of feed into the topic that you've been working with to a great extent, which is that decision-making in, in high-threat situations? How does that influence and how does that impact the, the decision-making for the incident manager on the ground? I think there's probably two main answers. To, there's a lot of answers, but two principal answers to it. One is the successes that I had overseas it wasn't due to enlightening people over there. It was due to motivating them, leading them, guiding them to make cultural changes, to make organizational changes that they actually believed in. They did the work. Had they not been willing to do the work, I wouldn't have been able to do any. So I speak across a leader board in that if a leader wants to affect change, you need to get by them. And there's different ways. I don't know that we have time to talk about all the different leadership approaches because there are in many, many leadership approaches. And I don't believe in any one. I believe it's a combination. Ultimately, situational leadership and adaptive leadership are, are going to guide the way. But 
got to get the people that you were working with, the people who are going to be the owners of the change who really want to change. And then it goes back to, okay, this is what we know today. Why are we doing it this way and how can we do it better? And that's what motivated me to go back to school, both for my master's degree and my doctoral degree, to ask these questions. And that's why I focused my doctoral dissertation on high threat decision making. What don't we know? And it was interesting because the process for the dissertation required me to go through what's called triangulation, which means I need three data sources. One was interviews, one was surveys, and one was focus groups, and triangulate the depth. In the interviews, I had 20 tactical incident commanders that I asked a series of questions to. They were all the same questions for consistency and all part of an and IRB institutional review board protocol. And one of the interesting questions, at least I found it interesting, because it caused everybody to pause for a second, was... How do you go about making a sound decision during a critical incident? And a lot of them said, I don't know. And it caused them to reflect upon the process that they use. And to me, I thought, hey, if I'm making them think about answers to questions, and keep in mind, these 20 commanders had between 79 and 113 years of critical incident management experience. I'm not talking about police experience. I'm talking about actual critical incident management experience and present this in ranges because I asked them as part of a demographic inventory for this study to present their experience in range. They've also been incident managers on between 704 and over 885 different critical incidents. So they had a well of information. And I wanted to learn from them without interjecting my input and my thoughts. And oftentimes, because several of them knew me, they would share, they, they would answer the questions, and then they'd wait for me to validate, or they'd wait for my opinion on what they did. And I couldn't do that as a research. I had to be independent and unbiased. It's impossible for always to be completely unbiased, but I set up a series of assumptions that I had going into it, and then I revisited my assumptions at the end in order to obtain answers to these questions and create models and knowledge that could be replicated, because that's a key. You don't want to do something that's going to be one time, one off on sports. You want to have something that can be replicable in other environments. So then if we are shaped by our- Say, so did that answer your question? <laughs> yes, yes. And it's interesting because if we are shaped by our, you know, our experiences and, and sort of, you know, previous performance and, and everything else, all these other sort of factors that go into us making our decisions. I am curious then about two other points that you sort of raised, which is, you know, how are people making decisions, why they make those decisions, especially under duress or, or any sort of extreme environments. And like you said, in high threat environments, if somebody's in those positions today, what can they do? And this is getting to sort of what we always talk about is, is that future forecasting a little bit in terms of our discussions. What can we do in, now when we have an eye towards the future and we see things we are becoming more complex, more complicated and different risks presenting themselves in terms of being on the response side of the house and trying to manage events and incidents. What are we seeing in terms of what can leaders do today? What can you know responders do today to sort of have that awareness, like you're mentioning, how do you make decisions and then improve on their decision-making capability, given the fact that if we're forecasting out, you know, that things can be ultimately more and more complex in the future. Excellent question. And that was really the focus of my book or one of the outputs of the book and the research that, that got combined. When we make a decision, it is going to be conscious, subconscious, or psychologists like to use the term non-conscious. And there's still great debate about whether we actually make unconscious decisions, how the brain works unconsciously. There's not as much debate about subconscious. So if we are making conscious decisions, we create a model. And the model becomes applied to a given environment. For example, created a predictive analytics high threat decision model for critical incident, decision making or critical incidents. It focused on hostage rescue, armed barricaded suspect, armed suicidal individual. There was a general model. The general model can be applied in any environment. It essentially consists of obtain and analyze data to comprehend the situation, 
and then connect past experiences to potential outcomes through a conscious and or subconscious predictive analytics process. And by predictive analytics, oftentimes, in answer to another part of your question, how do people make decisions? Oftentimes I'll hear, well, it was a it was gut, a gut decision. It was instant. I don't believe it comes from the gut. I believe it comes from the mind. And we predict the outcomes. Intuition is nothing more than what we predict the outcome to be based on a given decision. So I've applied the term predictive analytics to bits. We go through a conscious predictive analytics process. We also go through a subconscious, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, because that goes towards how we can improve in forecasting for future incidents. So I talked about the first aspect for a general predictive analytics decision-making model. The second one is observe and develop options based on an examination of data collected and decide on a specific course of action. Data collected is a key element. I am not prepared to say that on every incident, all intel is going to be bad, but I'm pretty comfortable in saying some aspect of the intel is going to be bad and we need to have a filtration system. I learned almost very hard what can happen with bad intel. When I was on a full-time SWAT team, we got a call for a murder suspect holding hostage. He was a suspect holding his family hostage. It was in a older, very old neighborhood, World War II style homes. It was around 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning. I just happened to be driving through that area of town. Call goes out, SWAT call out. I'm on my way, answer up, I'm on my way. I'll be there momentarily. Another officer who was on a full-time SWAT team, because we weren't working at the time, we had already finished working, we were on our way out, says, hey, I'll be there in five minutes, wait for me. So I go to the scene, we're unmarked cars, plain clothes, that was our typical attire. See the on-scene supervisor, who gives me a quick brief. I get all the intel from him. He essentially says, gives me the address, tells me where the house is. Uh, he set up a command post inside of a shopping center parking lot. Because nobody was there. It was the middle of the night. He says, go out this driveway from the lot, turn right, turn left, go up the hill. As you come down the hill, the target location is on the right side of the road. Cool. Got it. Other officer shows up, two of us. Uh, we knew the rest of the team was a ways away. So we were going to do a quick drive by, gather intel, and then set up an immediate action team after we got the in. So we get in our car, we drive down. We like to think we're high speed, low drag guys. We follow the instructions instead of going up the hill and pulling off to the right. We stay at the bottom of the hill. We pull on the left side road. It was dark. There were some street lights, but the mailboxes in this older residential neighborhood were up against the house since they weren't your typical mailbox that sits on the side of the road. So we get out of the car. We got to see where we're at, how many houses down. We know it's the opposite side of the road. We know it's the opposite side of the hill. So we go to the first house we see. There's a porch light on. There's a guy standing on the porch. We don't pay any attention to him. We're looking for the numbers on the mail. We walk up to the porch. Not a word was spoken. We looked at the numbers on the mailbox. We looked at each other. We made eye contact, and we jumped on the guy standing on the porch. As we take him down, a gun comes out of his back waistband, comes flying out on the pavement. We're able to take him into custody. That was the target location. I don't know where the police were set up, but they weren't set up at the target location. And we took him into custody. I won't repeat exactly what I said to the on-scene supervisor when, when I got back, but I said, why did you tell me, hey, go down, follow the street. It's on the opposite side of the hill and on the right side of, of the road. And he tells me a critical piece of intel that is infinitely valuable to me when I went, went there. He says, well, I never actually went to the target location. He said, I got this information from somebody who got it from somebody else who told me that's where it was. So when we go back to obtain and develop options based on examination of data, we need to have a filtration system to determine and validate this data. We were almost killed on this operation. He could have killed both of us had he taken a gun out and shot. Fortunately, we reacted fast. He was probably just as surprised to see two guys walking up in the middle of the night to his porch in plain clothes as we were just seeing him there. But he, he was armed and he had people held hostage inside. He just so happened to be standing on the porch. The third option as part of the model is analyze and evaluate short and long-term goals 
Ben decided on a plan that can achieve these goals. We're always going to want to have short-term goals, but the long-term goal is going to be successful resolution teams. And then apply an iterative critical thought process to achieve the ultimate goal of a successful resolution based on new information and change in So rarely will data at the beginning of an incident, plans at the beginning of an incident, go unchanged. As you're well aware, crisis incidents are not static. They are constantly evolving. And we need to implement a critical, an iterative critical thought process as things change with the ultimate goal of successfully resolving. So that's going to be a model that can be applied to any incident. What I then did was I applied this model to hostage rescue, armed barricaded suspects, and armed suicidal individuals. And I broke down every option that a hostage rescue suspect had, every option, every conceivable option, least the day. Every day somebody's going to come up with something in the future on this. And then I came up with, what are police responses to these options? So we've got police options. What are our options? What are suspect options? And then I applied the same methodology to armed suicidal individuals, armed barricaded individuals as part of an operations phase, as part of a recovery phase, and part of a post-incident resiliency. So going back, if we look at this plan, we can consciously study what are our options and how they can be applied in every the kind of plug and play until we have a significant amount of operations experience. Then it becomes, starts to become subconscious that, hey, this is what we've done in the past. This is how we draw from, no, this is a bad idea. Yes, this is a good idea. And apply that to given circumstances. And I believe these models can apply to any high threat decision making. Yeah, that's a very sort of interesting discussion because the first thing that I was thinking about when you were telling that sort of story is it made me wonder, especially in the context of this conversation, if the decision that the supervisor had made at that time was going to be a conscious or, or non-conscious decision, right? In terms of that type of perspective, which would have changed your entire process and your approach. And so it's interesting to think in, in terms of Everything you've mentioned, like his operational experience and sort of his environmental experience and, and everything else that he's been exposed to or she's been exposed to. And, and really, that piece of information, had it been filtered, had it been vetted and verified, would have been critical to the outcomes. So I'm just, you think in that moment in time, obviously, you've evolved well beyond that now in terms of your frameworks and decision-making models. But do you think at that point in time, when people are standing as an incident manager, or as a supervisor on a police scene, I'm just I'm genuinely curious if we're making decisions based on our own sort of instincts and if, we're, if we need to really have this sort of detached framework like you're talking about to sort of take away the, the gut reaction, quote unquote, so to speak, that you're mentioning. Well, I need to qualify the answer. I don't like the term gut reaction. I like the term predictive analytics. And sometimes the two can be synonymous. So it's not that I think we need to get rid of our instincts, intuition, probably a better word, when it comes to making decisions. But we need to make sure they are grounded in the, having a window, a legitimate window of opportunity and not the illusion of an opportunity. They are grounded in reality. They are grounded in experience, adaptive experience, not maladaptive. Oftentimes, incident managers haven't been properly trained or they don't have the experience. That's how we learn things. None of us was born doing this. We all go through a learning process to be able to do it. So that was one of the motivating factors for me to come up with these models so that people can use it as a guide. It's not going to answer everything. It's not going to be the end all. Hey, follow this model and you're going to have success. Why? I wish it would work that way, but it doesn't. It puts people on the right track so that they can predict, if I do this, that's going to happen. If I do that, then this is going to happen. So they understand what are the consequences of their decisions and they are prepared. What also goes along with this and is often underestimated is asking questions. And that was also one of the things that I developed for these types of incidents. What questions need to be asked? And oftentimes I said, we don't get the right information. So if we don't get the information, we need to ask the right questions. And if we don't ask the right questions, it's on us. Again, I mentioned this at the beginning, 
again, back to a police incident, what is the suspect's most likely course of action? If we're looking at it from disaster management type, what is the most likely course of action if we do X? What is the suspect's most dangerous course of action? And again, applying it to disaster management, crisis management. What's the worst thing that can happen if we do X? What do I need to know? And how are we going to respond to it? And oftentimes, incident managers don't respond to it because they never had it this before. For me, no decision is a decision. It's a decision not to make a decision. And people think that if they don't make a decision, they can't be wrong. I said, if I don't tell people what to do, I can't make a wrong decision. Well, in my mind, no decision is a decision. And that does not absolve us from actually making a decision. That's our position. We need to make the best decision, but it's the best decision that we can with the information that we have or should have had at the time we make the decision. That's why, again, I won't cast any dispersions on attorneys and judges and courts and litigation, but oftentimes, split-second decisions are litigated over months, years, when people have had an abundance of time to analyze. We make these decisions. We need to make these decisions based upon the information we have at that split second. It could change a second later, it could change a minute later, it could change an hour later. But the second part to this is information that we have or should have had. In other words, if we don't ask the right questions, we don't get a pass. Just because somebody didn't share this with us, it's incumbent upon us as incident managers to ask the questions to get that information or find somebody who can get that information. So that makes me think about the culture of leadership and leadership style in these organizations. So if it's incumbent upon everybody to ask questions, where do you find the balance in leadership then? And so obviously being comfortable with leadership positions and having people ask questions, especially in high threat situations and in high stress situations like what you're, you're normally dealing with. So what in sort of leadership style is that then for people when they have to be comfortable with asking questions, especially in really structured organizations? Again, I try to blend adaptive leadership with situational leadership, and this specifically speaks to situational leadership, because oftentimes there's there's a little bit of downtime, even in a critical incident. I want to hear from as many different people as possible. I want to hear, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And the same was born from the study that commanders articulated the same thing. It was almost a collective decision-making where, hey, it's not, we're going to do it. We're not going to do this because I say we're going to do it. We want to have the collective decision making. Give me your input. What do you think about this? Again, going back to what can go wrong if we make these decisions? But when it comes time to A, actually making a decision, or B, having to make a split second decision, this is what we're going to do. I will explain my decision later. And that's a key point because oftentimes leaders, they might make a decision and say, this is what we're going to do, but never explain why why they did it later on. And this also speaks to the importance of critical incident debrief. So everyone can learn from that. So if leaders don't have the opportunity due to time constraints to explain what they're doing, their team, the people who are participating in the incident, needs to understand and needs to trust that leader. And that's where everything leading up to that incident that is going to form that leadership model. Do I trust that leader? Do they trust that leader? If the answer is no, guess what? At that critical incident, that critical moment in time, they're not going to be followed. If they trust it, and they might say the wackiest thing in the world, people also must have a good reason for doing it, for saying that. We're going to follow. So it goes back to situational leadership, adaptive leadership, being willing to listen to others. I'll tell you another brief story that speaks to leadership and how everything, leadership isn't about leading one an incident. It's about what we do prior to that incident. And in the study that I did, part of, part of the, not the last book, but the previous book, SWAT Operations and Critical Incidents, Why People Die, there are organizational conditions and pre-incident organizational conditions that help guide us. So what we do before an incident is just as important as what we do the day of an incident. So I was leading a team. We were in the Middle East. Suspect who was under surveillance from a narcotics, made the narcotics undercover officer. He pulled a gun on them, threatened to kill them. He was a violent individual, a habitual drug user, threatened to kill them. They ended up 
kind of talking, diffusing the situation a little bit so they didn't get killed, but suspect got away. I get a call, my team gets a call, we show up about two hours away from where we're based. And long story short, they got search warrant, arrest warrant, search warrants for the suspect. It just so happened when I was there for the initial briefing, I was there with two captains and a team leader, and I, we were the ones that initially went to the call. One of the captains knew somebody in a neighborhood because while they were larger homes, they were all almost identical. So we had the opportunity to actually go into a identical floor plan to start devising our plan. Call the team out. In the meantime, again, I believe in doing drive-bys, gather as much intel as possible. I don't want to just rely on intel that somebody tells me. I want intel from my team, from my team commanders, my team leaders, the people that I trust. So the team, one of the captains and the team leader, they get white clothes, unmarked car. They do a drive-by. When they drive by, they see the suspect. He's standing outside close to the road playing with his two children. The team leader, who is one of the best SWAT officers I've ever found anywhere in the world, which is why I actually made him team leader, even though he was a junior. He was a senior officer, but junior SWAT. He had all the qualities you would ever want in a SWAT officer. So I caught him. He, I believe in the best person for the job. I made him team leader. He opens the door to jump out to grab the suspect, but at the last second, closes the door. They do the drive-by, they come back. The plan was to bring the team out and make this a team effort. There was no exigency, exigency at the time. Or he wasn't throwing all the hostages. He wasn't actively shooting at anybody. There's no exigency. And he came back and says, boss, I could have ended the incident. I was going to jump out. I was going to grab it. And I know I could have done it. The only reason I didn't do it was because if I did it, and I was successful, I knew you would not be happy and you would not be pleased with me. That was one of the greatest leadership compliments I ever got. And he was right. He'd have been in a penalty box for a while. I'd have probably removed him from the team leader position because he took that unilateral action. Now, I need to qualify because I firmly believe in looking for a window of opportunity, but there needs to be a distinction between a window of opportunity and the illusion of an opportunity. And that's where it goes back to the questions and what is going to consistently lead to the increased likelihood of a successful outcome. And yeah, maybe he could have done it. Maybe he could have got shot. Maybe he could have been, been killed. Maybe the kids could have got hurt. And while I'm not as concerned about the suspect, if we, we don't have to hurt the suspect, we don't want to hurt the suspect. But you know what? It put people's lives at undue risk had he done it, even if he would have been successful. So going back to your question about leadership, it all starts well before the day of incident. Yeah, it was very interesting. I, I like these sort of decision-making discussions and, and sort of diving into why we do what we do to a certain extent. I do want to talk about briefly as, as we're sort of almost running out of time here, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on sort of the increasing complexity of future incidents. So in your decision-making framework and your model, you're talking about how, what is the worst outcomes? Can we, and then sort of start outlining the outcomes. But what happens when we don't, it's not that we don't know, but let's just say we're getting increasingly complex crises that are happening, increasingly complex incidents that are occurring. There's probably a scale there where we see them increasing and we can probably predict to a certain extent some of the things that are going to happen. But I would just like to hear your thoughts about how we wrap our heads around just the increasingly complex and, and sort of even multiple threat environments that we're getting into these days. The simple answer is we break it down. Uh, we don't look at this, hey, this is an overwhelming problem. This is too complex. We break it down. There are certain common facts that happen almost every instance. And that was part of the study that I asked, hey, what are some of the common factors you see on a regular basis? And they play out. So regardless of the complexity, and probably the most complex incident for a police or military uh, response is going to be a terrorist incident. And it's going to be a multiple terrorist incident. Break them down, good communication, coordinated what are the common factors we see? Don't look at this as 10 incidents within one. Look at it as one incident occurring 10 times. And how are they interconnected? That's the other question. What is the interconnected? Let's say, for example, I opt to kill the suspects in this one incident. How is that going to play out in the other? We need to try to develop a concerted response, but don't get overwhelmed because it is complex. Try to play these things out. Be prepared. And part of this goes, speaks to training. You've got a wealth of experience. The people who are going to watch this have a wealth of experience. Part of training should be scenario-based. Not everything should be scenario-based. 
but part of it should be. So I would strongly recommend come up with the most complex situation you can think of. Run it as an actual scenario. See how it plays out. Learn for, hey, what did we do well? What did we do not so well? And how can we play this out? And that's one of the reasons, I mean, there's a lot of reasons that in the recent book, not the last one, again, in SWAT operations, one of the case studies was the Discovery Communications incident, which so far has been the only incident in the history of U.S. law enforcement that a suicidal bomber took hostage. Interestingly enough, and that was my old SWAT team, so I was had firsthand access to all the commanders involved, all the information. I was retired, so I wasn't involved in the incident. But I have firsthand information to you. And one of the contributing factors to their success was they ran that actual scenario in a similar building as a full team, full department call out a couple of months prior to the actual incident. So I think that goes a long way to realizing what we don't know. Because it goes back to the old saying, we know what we know, but we don't know what we don't. So trying to understand what we don't know and then planning for that. But don't get overwhelmed with these things. Trust other people. Delegate authority. You are the crisis manager. Delegation of authority is not abdication of responsibility. Make sure people are trained, people are processed. Have that process. It goes back to leadership. Uh, Grooming your successor. Making sure you have people in a position that can make these decisions. And just really break it down. And goes back to pre-incident organization commission. Being prepared for these types of complexities. And not just say, damn, we never had this. What are we going to do today? That's a problem. It's not a problem until it's a problem. That's one of the favorite saying I came up with. If you never have it, so what? It's never going to be a problem. But the one time you have it, if you're not prepared, not a problem until it's a problem. That's exactly right. Well, Dr. Stuart Myers, thank you for your time and being here today and sharing your insights and your thoughts. Really interesting discussion and breaking down how we can manage the decision-making high threat situations. Really appreciate it. If somebody wants to reach out and, and talk to you or find out more information, where can they reach you at? What's the best way? I've got a LinkedIn profile. They can be up there or they can send it to my email address. Same with your S underscore Myers, M-E-Y-E-R-S at Zoho, Z-O-H-O dot com. That's the fastest way to, to get it to me. Happy to answer any questions that I can. I get a lot of emails. Trust me, I will answer. If you don't get an answer in, in a week or so, it's because it goes in a black hole of wherever those emails go, but I'll try to be as responsible. Again, I want to thank you for having me on the show. That's what this is about. Nobody's got a lock on their knowledge. So it's about sharing knowledge and doing the best we can to help others. All right. Thank you very much. And the name of your book again, if just so everybody can go and pick up a copy. The last one is I Threat Decisions When It's a Matter of Life and Death. It was published by Springer. It's available with pretty much any online outlet from Springer to Amazon, Arts and Noble. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for that. And we will certainly be in touch. So thank you everyone for listening to another episode of Crisis Conflict Emergency Management Podcast. If you like what we've been talking about, it would be so kind to go leave us a review on any of your podcast platforms from Google to Spotify to Apple Podcasts. Just go ahead and leave a review and be very much appreciated. Until next time, stay safe and keep learning.